UW-Madison Campus Voices mission is to capture, present, and preserve some of the strongest historical stories and memories of UW-Madison through the people who lived them. Campus Voices, a project of the UW-Madison Oral History Program, consists of presenting extant archival material in 21st century formats, such as a podcast, mini-movie, and iTunes album. Our story begins in the closing years of World War II. Military actions overseas were coming to an end, and while the world had suffered devastating losses, the domestic economy had been revived by government investment in wartime industry. As young veterans began returning home, enrollment in universities across the nation began to rise, and in 1944, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, also known as the GI Bill of Rights. University education, once a privilege reserved for the rich, had been defined under the act as a right entitled to any eligible veteran who chose that path. The initial hope was to delay millions of young men's entrance into the workforce and to avoid a flooding of the job market. Indirectly, the bill brought about drastic changes in the character of American universities. While the national narrative hardly ends here, this is where our local story begins. At a large public university like UW-Madison, the enrollment increases were already cause for concern by 1943, when then-university president Clarence Dykstra called for the creation of a post-war planning commission to address the issue. By 1947, 23,000 students attended the University of Wisconsin at Madison. 11,000 of them were veterans. This massive influx demanded increasingly creative solutions in order to meet the new students' needs. And there were two concerns then. Where are we going to find the instructional space for these people? And most of them, being older, uh, many of them were married students, and so we had to find a com housing accommodations for them, and this uh, included almost every available space we could think of in the community, and we went so far as to go north uh, to Baraboo, where we uh, took advantage of the facilities that had been available to the workers at the ammunition plant up there and created a, a little community of our own called Badger Village. On December 7, 1945, the first student veteran moved into the former industrial complex. However, it wasn't until 1946 that a portion of the village was officially signed over to UW. Badger Village was initially conceived as an off-campus school to provide first-year classes such as English, mathematics, languages, and economics, along with on-site housing. However, due to great demand, it soon became a commuter village for veteran students of all ages. Then we had a choice of going into an attic somewhere in Madison with two little kids, out a fire trap of a house, or to Badger Village. There was no choice. We went to Badger Village in a hurry and were very glad to get there. I think I'd, I would describe it as a sort of strange domesticated army base. I was thinking about this, and, and what did it look like to me? And that's about as near as I can come. And then as you get closer, and as you get inside, they all seemed like, a, well, a house of cards, say. A very fragile, kind of impermanent feeling about this, these little quarters that we were in. It was roomy enough, but it was uh, very, very fragile, I thought. Not, not slated long for this world. We were just happy to be by ourselves, and it, it was it was very rudimentary. It was just uh, two rooms. It was in a like a converted barracks. It had been a barracks for people that worked in the ordnance plant, I believe, Badger ordnance plant, right? Anyway, we thought that was it was fun. It was going to be fun, and it, they did a nice job on converting those. They were two, like I say, two rooms. One was a one room was a, a part kitchen, part dining room part living room and everything was new like they had a, a new hide bed in there a new kitchen table and chairs and a little apartment sized stove and not a refrigerator it was an ice box mm -hmm. and and then the bathroom facilities were down the hall we had trouble getting enough buses uh, we had uh, only two what i call city type buses uh, built by ford there were four transit buses and the rest was a collection of dilapidated school buses and ex-army buses that uh, we were lucky to keep going. I remember one particular bus bouncing along down East Washington Avenue one night, bounced right off of its chassis. The body seemed to go in one direction, the chassis in another. However, we were pretty resourceful, and even though the bus looked like it fell apart, we had it back together and running again. 
one evening we were coming back from uh, university and um, and the bus it was 14 below zero and the bus stopped in Middleton and refused to run so then we all got out and hitchhiked back up to Baraboo and um, I thought some more about how nice it would be to be back in Washington. I hadn't had that hard a time, even in the Army. Uh, we had one severe winter in 47 and 48. There was a big storm in early December. It partially melted and refroze in mid-December and never really melted until March or April. Uh, so always the walking was treacherous. Even though they tried to use salt and sand, the driving was very bad and the walking was almost impossible. Now the highways, of course, were okay because they were taken care of, but, but the village itself in that year was, a, was an ice, uh, I don't know how to describe it, a place of torture, I guess. Uh, <laughs> In the, same, in the same measure that the winters were cold, the summers were very hot because there was no uh, circulation of air. And the bedroom had little tiny windows. We had to have a fan blowing directly on us all the time for any air at all. Everybody was in the same boat. Yeah, that's what I think probably what made it enjoyable. Nobody had any money. And you counted your pennies at the end of the month. And there was a uh, general store right on the on the grounds, so you could go to that. We, I think we call it the commissary. I don't know if that was the right term. And um, and then in the summer, <clears throat> they provided uh, grounds uh, and land for us to have a garden. So we had a garden. And they plowed it. Yeah. For us. And uh, it was a good size garden. Had a garden. It was about uh, 40 by 60, 40 mm -hmm. feet by 60. Mm -hmm. So and we thought it was pretty much fun. I don't know if I. Um, I don't know if I'd want to, certainly wouldn't want to do it again right now, but I, at the time we thought it was, uh, was not too bad. By its very nature, Badger was a unique community comprised of families with similar situations, experiences, and backgrounds. The pervasive feeling of community developed out of these common bonds, but also by democratic design. At its inception, Badger Village was intended to be much more than simple university housing. It was meant to be a microcosm of American government and society. The village included an operating community center, post office, community council, police force, and an elected president. Alongside these civic operations, Badger also contained a shopping center, barber shop, drugstore, and primary school. Of course, diversions and entertainment were also important elements of the student experience. The, um, let's see, another aspect of the uh, uh, lifestyle at Badger, the uh, the recreational, the basketball court served as a dance hall, and there were occasional dances uh, and parties, village-wide parties that were held there. And on Sundays, that facility was used for church services. We we're uh, Catholic, and the assistant from the parish in Sauk City used to come out and uh, say mass in the gym. And I think that there were uh, Protestant services in the gym. So. Th in a sense, it, it was a real community. All aspects of the lifestyle, all aspects of what you'd want in life really were provided right there at Badger Village. It was truly a village. Women and men experienced Badger Village very differently. While men were called the academic woes, the women spent most of their daily lives in the village caring for children and managing the household. The Badger Village wives were typically highly educated, often holding college degrees themselves. They were young mothers who rarely found opportunities to leave the village and many were civically involved. Speakers, support groups, women's organizations, and social activities that included discussions of contemporary issues sprang up as vital parts of life at Badger, and wives played an active role. Here, Peggy Baim describes her experience in leading the Badger branch of what was called the Great Books Club. So uh, we went into Madison, got this training for several weeks, and read the material and came back, et cetera, et cetera. Came back and sat at a long table and put out a call, anybody wanting to talk great books, come. And we began talking Greek culture and all this, and the women began pounding fists, looking across the table, 
They'll say, well, you know, people who could really do this would be blah, blah, you know, and the other one says, you haven't been in my shoes. You haven't been spit on. And suddenly this debutante type, you know, it was just shook up. They would turn pale. They would confront each other. But they all stuck it out and listened. And it was mind-boggling to both sides of these women from both sides of the tracks in an old-fashioned way of saying it. Residents were also visited by campaigning politicians such as the Socialist Party leader Norman Thomas, George Nelson, and, of course, Joe McCarthy. Two of the women in our interviews recalled Senator McCarthy's visit, though the accounts differed greatly. Phyllis Young recalled seeing McCarthy and viewing his talk quite favorably, enough so that she voted for him, which she later regretted. Peggy Bame, well, this is how Peggy recalled it. And McCarthy came out, and he was talking along, and then the veterans would be hollering at us, electing us, something, something. Finally, he hollered out, and he says, isn't there a Republican in the place? <laughs> he, just got, he just got shook up about that one. The courses and programs available at the university had been designed to provide an enriching experience for students from well-to-do families. But, as we've discussed before, the GI Bill had brought about a demographic shift in the student population. Well, the veterans who had uh, had, had to postpone their education anywhere from uh, three to five years who are anxious to to get their education and they didn't want anything to interrupt that and they were they were very serious uh, the university installed a 12 week sem uh, summer semester so they could go right through and not and not lose any any time they could take a full semester's work in the summer and uh, this, uh, a lot of students did that. Uh, students, uh, a number of the veterans who might not have been able to go to uh, the university before World War II because of the, of the Depression, were now able to go to school. And they, were ser they had worked and had working experience and were serious, and they they put forth considerable effort. Uh, this was not a rah-rah campus at that time. When the Ordinance Works reopened as an arsenal for democracy, official university affiliation with Badger Village ceased in 1952. What the university intended when they opened Badger that it would remain open perhaps three or four years until the peak of the enrollment had passed and uh, building in Madison caught up. However, uh, building in Madison didn't catch up that fast, and the enrollment didn't slow down that, that quickly. Furthermore, living at Badger was very inexpensive. Uh, many of the, the veterans paid only $18 a month rent, and the maximum was about twenty six fifty, and you couldn't touch that in Madison. And while admittedly there were some hardships in living there, once you got used to it, it was pretty reasonable. And again, as the social activities and recreational activities increased, it became a reasonably attractive place to live. And so it was a pretty reasonable thing. And students decided we don't want to move until we finish our careers, our academic work. Students were still living there in 1951 when the Korean War required that the ordnance plant be opened be, uh, to produce powder. And at that point, the federal government decided they wanted to take back the housing. So we had to terminate our lease in 1951 with the agreement that students could remain who were there until they f moved out or finished their careers, whichever happened last. If you would like to find out more about our Campus Voices collection and hear more stories like this from the university archives, please visit our website at archives.library.wisc.edu slash oral dash history slash campus voices. I would also like to thank the Brittingham Fund. Their generosity allows us to share these fascinating histories with the campus community and to preserve the voices of our past. Thank you.